Hey, good morning, Galen. Yeah, we got a little bit of light rain out there. We got some fog in the valley. Let's take you out to the coast right now. This is Yaquina Bay in Newport. There is a high surf warning in effect for much of the coast until 6 o'clock tonight. We got clouds. We are dry out there on the coast right now. Winds are calm. We're at 48 degrees in Newport here in the metro area. We talked about that fog. There it is, 42 degrees. Still some light sprinkles out there. We have that front move through. It is on its way out right now, leaving behind quite a bit of moisture in the air in the form of fog. So visibility down about three miles in the metro area, about two and a half miles in Aurora, and you can see that fog up and down the valley. Not quite as dense as what we saw yesterday, so no advisory in place, but uh, something to keep an eye out for if you're heading out this morning. Here's a look at how your Sunday is shaping up. We'll be right around 45 degrees, mostly cloudy by noon. Again, the rain moving out, so we're looking at a dry yet mostly cloudy day. Temperatures topping out right around 48 degrees. So today is the day to get outside and enjoy the dry weather because tomorrow we have a soaker of a system moving in. We'll talk more about that coming up in your full forecast, Galen. All right, Keely, thank you so much for the update. We'll see you in a little bit. We now know the name of the Tigard police officer who shot and killed a 26 year old man earlier this week. He's officer Gabriel uh, Gabriel Maldonado, excuse me, and he's been with the department for 14 years and is on administrative leave this morning. He shot and killed Jacob McDuff on Wednesday. Police were called to his apartment for a domestic disturbance. The Oregonian reports dispatch audio warned police that callers had concerns about McDuff's mental health. Police said McDuff had a knife and resisted arrest. During a struggle, Maldonado shot him. McDuff's background shows no criminal record, but neighbors told us police were called to his apartment five times in the two days before the shooting, all for mental health concerns. His death led to protests in Tigard on Thursday night. Police declared a riot when some people smashed windows at police headquarters and businesses downtown. Let's turn now to the coronavirus pandemic. Yesterday, Oregon reported more than 1,600 new cases and 28 more deaths. OHA says overall cases in Oregon did drop sharply in late November and early December before surging in recent weeks. The agency says at the current rate of transmission, we could see an average of at least 1,700 new cases every day by the middle of this month. Now, vaccines are crucial in Oregon's fight against COVID-19. So the Oregon National Guard is joining the effort on Tuesday. 130 Guard members have been activated to support Salem Health's vaccination efforts at the state's fairgrounds. And this is part of Governor Kate Brown's push to get 12,000 people vaccinated a day by the end of next week. Right now, Salem Health is only able to administer two to 3,000 a day. Obviously is going to allow us to continue this operation because this isn't a, a one week or a two week operation. We're going to be doing this for months. For now, those shots are only being given to people in the 1A group who live or work in Marion County. Vaccine supplies are still limited, so they're not sure when they'll be able to open to more patients. Starting Monday, the Portland VA will expand vaccinations for local veterans, and there are some key details for people who may qualify. The Portland VA is getting ready for a big campaign. If they receive the call, please um, accept the vaccine. Claire O'Geary is the COVID-19 vaccine coordinator for the VA Portland Healthcare System, which has already started vaccinations. Into our essential workers and into our veterans as well. The first veterans in long-term care got the shot at the Vancouver campus in mid-December. Since then, the VA has vaccinated dialysis and chemotherapy patients too. Now the VA is expanding the list. By age and by their um, clinical conditions. The VA is contacting veterans directly who are 75 and older, especially those with other conditions that put them at higher risk. Starting Monday, January 11th, it will vaccinate them in rooms like this, spaced out. How many people do you anticipate in that group? Um, we are um, expecting about 61,000. That could take about three months, spanning the VA's seven regional sites in Portland, Vancouver, Hillsborough, West Lynn, Salem, Fairview, and Bend. The VA recently got permission to ship vaccines as needed. Transported in a refrigerator with continuous monitoring. And with a national network at its disposal. We are able to pull from resources that are across the country and get best practices that others too have set up. Unused vaccines will be shared, not wasted. The VA emphasized it will contact those who qualify, so veterans should not call in to ask. 
Updates are also posted online. Claire O'Geary is a nurse by trade. She says the vaccine is safe and our golden ticket. Get back to what we used to call a normal life. Now, as the pandemic gets more deadly, nurses at Providence hospitals want more protections. About 100 ONA nurses and their families joined a caravan yesterday. They went past multiple Providence buildings in the Portland area. Signs on cars read, protect people, not profits. And they're demanding the hospital system provide more COVID-19 safety measures for both them and their patients. We are still negotiating for very basic protections, such as tracing, um, testing, adequate personal protection equipment, notification when we've been exposed, and also a very important sick leave, which has been contested by our employer. Now, Providence facilities have had a few recent COVID outbreaks. Around Christmas, Providence Portland Medical Center had an outbreak in a medical surgical unit. 13 patients tested positive, along with 36 caregivers working in that unit. We did reach out to Providence about the nurses' demands and it did not want to comment. And we do have an update now about the deadly U.S. Capitol riot. Federal prosecutors have made more arrests, including the man seen dragging the speaker's lectern and another who wore a fur hat with horns. The investigation into Wednesday's deadly attack continues as calls for President Trump's removal from office intensify. At least 180 members of Congress have signed on to an article of impeachment, accusing him of incitement of insurrection. Now, the riot is a big topic on this week's edition of Straight Talk, and you can watch Oregon Senator Ron Wyden's full interview with our Laurel Porter later this morning at 10 o'clock, right after Meet the Press. It is also available for you online. Over the last seven months, we've seen a lot of damage to Portland businesses during other protests and riots, and some people have justified that destruction, saying insurance will cover it. But as our Catherine Cook reports, mounting risk is making it hard for some downtown businesses to get any insurance coverage at all. In downtown Portland, plywood and graffiti is the new cityscape, only it's not new anymore. Since last spring, businesses have been dealing with damage and looting from riots and protests, most recently organized by anti-capitalist groups. In May, Mercantile Portland suffered over a million dollars in damage and looting. Just getting everything uh, accounted for and cleaned up and rebuilt and put back together, we didn't open until September 24th. General Manager Eric Murphy just wanted to move forward and stay positive, but then another blow. About that time, we got a letter of non-renewal from our insurance company. Murphy says his insurance broker tried over a dozen top-tier carriers, but none of them were willing to insure the store. Finally, an insurance company from a wholesale market wrote them a policy. It was a, a really awful policy. It's four times the premium we were paying, and um, it doesn't cover, you know, things like uh, uh, civil unrest or kinds of things that happened here it will not be covered. We definitely had a front row seat to a lot of loss this year and that's been hard. Barb Schimmel is with Assured Partners, the insurance broker that helped Mercantile find coverage. She says the reality is in every market, underwriters must assess risk in part by looking at trends and liability. Prior to the election, for example, some underwriters were waiting to see the outcome of the election. Many others were just kind of looking at headlines, some carriers are very familiar with Portland, while others are further away geographically. Even outside of what happened in 2020, insurance brokers say they were already facing what's called a hard market, created in part by liability losses across the nation, including from the California wildfires. That didn't leave insurance carriers a lot of wiggle room when considering more risk. So while it might be hard now, you know, is it going to get harder or are we going to see some type of solution or how do we create that solution? Some businesses are finding solutions by making tough decisions. I decided not to have my earthquake policy anymore just to be able to keep my rates to a reasonable, manageable level. A catastrophic earthquake hits and, you know, I'm kind of messed up then. Stephen Lynn owns Under You for Men. His insurance rate went up 15% when he renewed last fall after claiming just one broken window. Since then, he's lost two more windows at $4,000 a pop. I kind of got lucky in the timing at the moment, uh, but I, I am concerned. I mean, they can still cancel you. For many businesses, deductibles are so high, fixing broken windows is on them. 
it's the small businesses that are bearing the brunt of, of this burden. It's incredibly sad and very hard to watch. Portland real estate developers Vanessa Sturgeon and Jim Mark helped start Rose City Downtown Collective, a group aimed at rebuilding the local economy and the spirit of downtown. They started a GoFundMe to help small businesses replace broken windows as they continue suffering damage. It's an attack on all Portlanders and we need this revenue. Without a sales tax, the state needs healthy businesses. Businesses like Mercantile Portland. Eric Murphy uh, hopes to thrive again, though with his insurance uh, policy. It makes us anxious. Uh, we're keeping the boards up. It feels a little like flying without a net. Just to, to protect ourselves because the city's not doing that for us. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Hmm, definitely a tricky story there. Well, still to come, one of the largest high schools in Oregon now has its own student health care center. We're going to look at the services being offered at Reynolds High School coming up.